So if time shifted is the ultimate convenience, why are so many people still watching live, live, live TV? And the answer has to be that they want to be able to say, I saw that last night. And, you know, it's that shared experience of, of TV. And, and on, on the social side, I think the ability to um, to extend the social aspects of TV is definitely is definitely uh, coming. Uh, I'm not sure to what degree. So there's a company called Bluefin Labs that tracks these kinds of things already, and they have some interesting software for that. And, and they, they cited that the, la the largest amount of social activity this last month was for the presidential address, and they, where they had 100,000 comments, social comments, o over the course of the presidential address. And that blew away the, the, the uh, first game of the NFL that was uh, following right after that, right? So when you think of it in terms of proportion, 36 million people watched the presidential address. So you're still talking a, a very tiny percentage of the total audience that, is, that actually saw that content. Yeah, but how do you know that it's not the presidential How do we know? The, the that's what I'm saying. That, that's what I don't understand. Like, unless Blue you can log into your, your, your TV through Facebook, like, I don't know, like, in my world, that, that's not social. Like, water cooler talk about this, you know, this football game that happened is completely meaningless and you can't track it, and it's so that you can't sell it. These were comments that are made in either Twitter or Facebook about the presidential address. Right. I mean so there's still, it's still bifurcated, though. It's so the social part of TV and, like, smart TV, which is this total oxymoron of all time, is it's, it's yeah. bifurcated. Like, you cannot – it's TV is still over here, and then you have to go put that down, open up your laptop, and go, oh, man, Top Chef is awesome. I agree. That's I, what sucks about it, and that's really well. I think yes and no. I could ar I could argue the other part of it. I, 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 my ideal TV screen doesn't even have the the, the network logo on it. I want to just see the show, right? Or I want to. I'm a big soccer fan. I don't want to see all the stats. I don't want to see. Now, as a side app that I can that I can look at and search and see, I would love that, right? But in terms of the viewing experience. I want to have as clean of experience as possible. And to have all my friends popping in and checking in on it, it will actually ruin my viewing experience. Well, I, I can say I'm, I'm an Arsenal fan. And a couple of weeks ago, <laughs> I had to watch a, a horribly bad game on a Saturday morning against Manchester. Watching it on the screen, I'm on Arsenal, on the Arsenal on my iPhone. I didn't want to talk to anybody. So, <laughs> you know, it's like it was one of the most brutal experiences in television. Television is a very passive medium. People forget it is, and if you read Marshall McLuhan's book, he argues TV is designed for passive minds. When you talk to network sellers, they will always tell you, as you know, sell to the people we were talking about in Topeka. Go home, mom, dad, Jamie, and John sit there, 6 o'clock, watch the local news, watch primetime, watch Leno or Carson or Letterman. Carson obviously is dating myself. <laughs> but um, <laughs> watch that late night and go to bed. It was a very predictive business model, and you're absolutely right, but it's a passive model. What, I, what digital has done is it has brought that sense of activity to a very passive world, and it has led them to confusion, and I also think it's the opportunity um, for the next couple of years. And I, I find it interesting with the presidential address. CNN gets excited when they get 600, when they get 600 homes commenting on the president. 100,000 people commenting on the tweet. You know, if you're looking at analytics, I'd rather have 100,000 who are looking at it than 600. Hey, John, can you remind us the score in that game? Yes, it was 8-2. to two. Yeah. I want to make sure that the yes. yeah. we'd rather just yeah, go home. Uh, so uh, my wife's grandmother lives in a retirement home in, in New Jersey. She's just turned 100. And, you know, she was surprisingly told us that she is uh, that, that resident, that she's a champion of bowling. And, uh, so we were very uh, concerned about that until we realized it's all about Nintendo Wii bowling. So that, <laughs> that was a great relief. But uh, is there a point where the usability, uh, there's a, a, a critical mass of usability uh, that we, we still haven't reached? We talked before about how complicated those are. And... Uh, we still, I mean, going back to the fact that this panel bet against Apple on this industry, which I think is very interesting, uh, is there a, a point where the, the critical mass of utility actually turns this into a mass phenomenon? Well, it, you know, we're going into an era of mass substitution. And, and, and uh, everything, the reason the television, that article you were, you were uh, showing in the Wall Street Journal, the reason the television still gets uh, the volume that it does is the only place where we can buy uh, weeks. Now, weeks today is a four-day show, where it used to be a 225-day show. But 
Facebook that it keeps available uh, to the internet with all the talk about we three that it keeps. Um, the the uh, we will have mass customization, and and everybody will will be kind of doing it over and over again. Does the internet offer direct and mass customization? Yeah. I don't, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't I don't understand. I, I I actually agree that TV is very much heading in this direction. Um, as uh, as addressable TV comes into play, uh, some of you may know, some of you may not know, but today. There are three million homes in the New York area that are getting household addressable TV ads. Okay, so at that point, now it's, it's right now being used heavily for program promotion and for cable vision zone marketing, but there are already major advertisers like AT&T and Army that, it, that are using addressability at that level, and, and it's the ability to segment your customer base or your prospect base and actually send more meaningful ads within the context of the same insertion, which makes TV much more efficient. So that's a that's a type of that mass customization that, that you're just that it you're is. talking and, about. And and if I were well on panels like this five years ago, I talked about this addressability model. Uh, it it, it uh, I didn't see how it could actually happen because who is going to buy after everybody cherry picks all those people they want to address? Who is going to buy the rest of the activity? Well, uh, exchanges and DSPs have given us that solution, and so the solutions, the technology solutions of the of the internet are going to be ported over. Forget the consumer experience, are going to be ported over to the television marketplace and help make the marketplace whole and help make that, uh, that addressability uh, affordable because there will be a market for that untold internet. Yeah, and the other use case I share in, in San Francisco, Cavion, which is already doing this with television. Yeah, from a creative uh, execution standpoint, is there anything to look forward to? Uh, in this world with smart TV, with or without rotation mode? Uh, anything to look forward to interactive TV not making the mistake that Rich Media did over the last 10 years, which is completely overselling every feature and every everything is trackable for 10 years, and then you realize 10 years later that actually nobody was doing it. So it's like 98%. Every, every time you add a click on a website, you lose half your traffic. Every time you add a click on, on an expandable ad, you lose 98% of your traffic. Like it's just the end of it. So all those extra panels and the fun features and the games, if it's not on the initial panel, it doesn't get used. So if people, the, the, the idea that you know, Western TV watches all these like amazing PowerPoint presentations and everything tomorrow and there's ID and there's glasses and it's gonna be like utopia. But just because you can do it doesn't mean you should do it. And, and, and it doesn't it doesn't make it good. It doesn't it's just because it's cool or it sounds cool to your boss or that you could sell into it and get another twenty percent this year off it. Doesn't mean that it's gonna last or it's a good idea. So if if anything, I'm praying that the, the old dinosaurs, which I, I think is a, is is respectfully not a, a good metaphor for, for the people who are in, in broadcast right now because we're in digital advertising right now, if we're such hot shit, we're selling fifteen year old technologies. Like twenty three percent of, of digital advertising uh, is, is banner ads, like 15-year-old technology, like Flash 3 came out in 98. So we're not such hot shit either in the technology department. We're still selling a bunch of old stuff and other places. So if, if broadcast can do is just, just look and learn and then move forward instead of have the same epiphany that we all had in the 90s, like, oh, we can do anything and we're going to recreate the world. It's a whole new economy. And then in 2001, everything collapses. If they avoid that mistake, that's what we can really look forward to because then we'll actually have progress. Then we'll do shit that's cool. So keep it, keep it, I said shit. So keep it, <laughs> so keep it, keep it permissive, you know? Don't put, you know, I saw Point Will put some, you know, they, their idea of interactive TV is we're going to drop a banner and then you expand it and it pauses your show and then you can check out, you know, the, the Grand Le Saber. That's, that sucks. What you really want is you want, you want to be watching you know, a, a, you know, a show in the CW, and then you want, you want to, there has to be some bucket or some panel or some thing that anybody can throw stuff into, okay? And, and you click that button, and it opens up, and then there's, like, the shoes that, that, that the, the actress is wearing, and it's, like, immediate shoe dazzle, like you're selling your shit at a shoe at that point, right? And that's, like, that's how you, if you're advertising, because you're, the shoe, you're advertising the shoe's old, that's how it should work, not like, oh, we're gonna, here's another thing, roll over for more, get the, here's a little call to action, and we're going to make a light wash on the button, like all that, throw all that out, forget, let's forget that, well, we, we, this is the R&D of, we've done it for them, so don't, don't have them just redo it all over again. So, you know, I think that's, uh, but I don't really care, <laughs> I don't really care about this stuff, you know, I don't, you know, I'm talking about my ass. Another no. way 
to look at it, I think almost the, the, the cultural difference between uh, folks in, in, in online is almost inability to keep things simple versus folks coming from a TV. Okay, then John, maybe I ask you, what do you think is gonna be leading it from an advertising standpoint? Is it gonna be the traditional buyer? Is it gonna be the, the online folks? So you asked a question about how did I see that in five years? I, and I actually think that the 12 to 15 people in New York who can still get that work done are really looking at digital right now and trying to figure it out and realize it's the power of being able to sell that international. And how do we make, how do we balance the, you know, the 22 million dollars that we can make on the screen? I think they're, and then how do we take this fascinating thing called digital and work? I think they're gonna be the leader. I think people who understand this work from both sides I would put my money on the under on the big television buyer who bought network that could be buying digital and work from us. I think that that's the, it just makes sense. I think 2012 is gonna be a fascinating year because with all the politics and the convergence of the politics of the Olympics in the same year, you have a massive amount of money. You go back all the way into 19, 1960 and see when you both of those together in the same year, the amount of money that comes in to television is massive they're gonna have a massive control of money. And I think they're going to be very interesting to see how they spend, because they will spread that out across all these different video devices, and they will have the better control left. But the brands will crush it, because they get the big picture. Great, great story, Doug, because there's no question, when, when, a, when a client goes out and, and decides that they have to update things, and they want innovation, they put innovation in every other paragraph in their RFP, right? And then they hire, one of the top four or five companies, right? Uh, no matter how much innovation they want, and no matter how much innovation is coming out of, of, of these other options, uh, they feel better by hiring a multinational company and some guy who's controlling billions of dollars, and, and, and they feel that he's got that clout to reduce the price by 0.3% and across their $200 million budget, that ends up being a lot of, a lot of money. That rules. They've got, they control the budget, and that's the reality. So they're gonna get the best innovation that the big guys can bring us. I think there's another category to watch, and that's the program promotion category, and, and, and to some degree, movie entertainment as well. But program promotion in particular, if it was actually quantified dollars, it would be the single largest vertical uh, for advertising. Um, but um, a lot of the networks are gonna begin to experiment with these platforms for their own program promotion purposes, whether it's addressability or interactivity or expanded format, uh, uh, companion, companion elements on tablet. Uh, so that I, would, I would be very attentive to what's happening in the program promotion space because they're using it to both understand and validate how this works, but also to figure out what the business models are gonna be for, for advertisers at large. And I wouldn't be surprised to actually see some throttling on the, on the general advertiser front, but a lot of experimentation on the program promotion front. And then the other one to watch for is the Olympics. Uh, uh, NBC, Comcast, NBCU are gonna put, be very aggressive on, on innovation on, around the Olympics because they see it as a four year cycle to, to keep coming back with innovation. So they're gonna be pushing a lot of innovation into the Olympics. On top of that with the one billion dollars that will be spent in political and advocacy money coming into a world looking for devices, it's gonna be an interesting year for cable. We were talking about ESG before, and you know, in the online space, we're very much looking and talking about micro-targeting and micro-messaging and so on and so forth. Uh, is, it, is that a concept that's gonna carry through to this, to, to this convergent world? Um, is, it, is it really that important when you're talking about a, a brand uh, objective as, as we have on TV? I don't think ESG is that important as far as brand objectives on the internet. I think ESGs are where these sites are able to sell their employee names by using the experience. Uh, but they're still talking about forward buys and using tech, other technology uh, to do brand ac activity and then overlaying targeting on top of it. And it's gonna be the same thing. They're gonna make forward buys and they're gonna overlay uh, a targeting mechanism uh, in order to do addressable television. Uh, DSPs are gonna come in uh, for that unsold inventory uh, and dealing with that television experience. Claudia, from an addressable advertising uh, on TV, what are some uh, great case studies that uh, you think uh, allow us to understand what's now possible with traditional 
So the, the, the key thing that we've learned is that for brands that have a direct consumer relationship, you can actually segment your target audience now between customers and prospects. And so for example, we ran an AT&T campaign where existing customer was being uh, upsold or cross-sold new phones or new plans. Uh, new, brand new customers were being sort of reinforced on their decision. And then for the rest of the audience, which were potential prospects, they were using a more traditional demographic segmentation. Uh, families with teenagers, older folks, uh, you know, single, and, and just the ability to send a different message to each of those segments improved the efficiency of the buy dramatically, but more importantly, the effectiveness by being able to actually match it back to sales results so that you can actually see what the impact on sales was, and you're talking about du double digit impact on sales. And so TV has never really had that power to basically track back the sales, or it was done through panels and things like that, but to be able to actually measure the impact on sales, it, that's been very, very powerful. And, and there's now a number of advertisers that have gone that route. Uh, so I, I, again, I think for brands that have direct consumer relationships, addressable television provides a, a new toolkit that's very potent. <coughs> from, a, from a creative standpoint, you know, obviously with TV and media mind, uh, we are very keen to see it, how can we really uh, repurpose the creative across, the, across these channels? And we run into some, even some basic obstacles we talked about earlier before the, this conference, or before this, uh, this discussion about the SAG agreement and the ability to utilize that. So can you share what are some of the uh, uh, roadblocks that exist there and how is that going to be resolved? Do I add or myself start? I, I mean, I guess I can, so uh, today, um, the SAG-AFTRA agreements, the talent agreements are such that in television, you basically pay for talent for every unique spot uh, there's some clauses for tagging, but for the most part, you pay for every unique spot, and so you pay a session fee for every unique spot and an airing fee for every 13 weeks that a commercial airs, regardless of whether it airs once or a million times. Same fee, right? But that, what that means is that if you're actually trying to use creative variation, your talent cost can go quickly through the roof. Or if you want to use addressability to target different ads to different segments, your talent can go through the roof. On the online side, the agreement, the current agreement is such that you can pay for three times the initial cost to be able to use the talent through a, through a variety of online channels. That, now that's very reasonable, right? Now, the, the upcoming SAG-AFTRA agreements that are being driven by the Joint Policy Committee of the ANA and the 4As will, for the first time, have impression, be impression based next year for national commercials. In, sometime in the future for local, but for national commercials, it means that you can now have a spot that only airs once and only impacts that you can actually use it in test and test the different scenarios and then use the ones that work. So there's a lot of room for, for improvement on, 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 on the talent front. A lot of people are going to Canada because they can avoid some of the talent repercussions that, that, that exist here in the U.S. From an analytics uh, standpoint, and this one maybe for you, David, but a million dollar question, what metrics are we, should we be looking at? Well, it's going to be more than a million dollars for, uh, uh, I mean, the fact is we use 15 buyers, 12, 15 buyers a year minimum. Uh, they, there have been companies that have come in and uh, there was a company in the early 90s called Beaky that spent almost $100 million to come up with a solution. Uh, and they went to NBC and got NBC to buy in on it. Uh, they forgot to go to the buyers, even though the buyers don't pay as much of the money. NBC pays most of the money. They didn't go to the buyers, and they got killed they, because they didn't get permission from the people who were spending the money, right? So um, now Nielsen is not capable, even if, though they've got net rating, of doing uh, the uh, uh, all the things that we need to do relative to engagement and, and serving and, and, and optimizing all that stuff. So uh, I don't know what, what the price is. You could probably guess. But Nielsen's going to have to find media minds and things like that. That's just me guessing. For Talent uh, reverse. Uh, for, yeah, we go. Or media minds, given what happened to cab values today, media minds should buy Nielsen, right? Uh, but but uh, that brand is going to control the ratings because they don't have the technology. And the only way that they can achieve the technology is to go buy innovators like you guys. So we've been looking at uh, audience measurement uh, guidelines by the IAB. Is that, is that going to be impactful in a situation where those buyers are just looking at the traditional metrics? Well, you know, this could 
traditional method, I mean, it's, it's, it's very similar to the, uh, to, to the, uh, to the challenge situation. The traditional method is grading points. And it's grading points with the assumption that if, uh, if, if a show, if the television is on, that there's a certain quality of audio uh, there uh, watching it, or even if it's being recorded, that it got played back. Okay? Uh, well, it's not that way with, 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 with Internet. We're, we're buying impressions, and we're trying to uh, get something more than the video was started. We're trying to get the video was played all the way through, or 30 seconds, or 15 seconds. Uh, and, and so they're completely different parameters, and they don't, uh, they don't, they, they don't equate. And there's got to be some normalization of that before we can uh, really have uh, a single metric, even though, again, Nielsen right now today is trying to release uh, uh, reports that, that supposedly bring the two together. But, in fact, uh, they use the terminology differently. I, I do think that the, the, the addition of set-top box data is actually going to bring more internet-like metrics to television. So with, with, with addressable television, we can actually count the impressions. We know that a set-top box is on. We don't know if the TV is in front of that box. It, 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 we still don't know, but we can actually we track every channel change. So we know when there's a bit of an activity on that box, so it's sort of the equivalent of a click. And uh, the uh, it's better than what there's been what's been done before. And it's interesting because. Uh, there's been enough analysis of the set-top box data that actually validates that the Nielsen ratings have been a pretty good coin of the realm, except when you get into the, the lower rated stuff or the local or some of these things. But um, I do think that m more internet-like metrics are coming to television. I think that, the, and, and television needs to, 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 to improve the quality of its measurement capability. In theory, but whether Nielsen will actually execute on them is another thing. Uh, how many out here have bought television sets here? Did you all know that for the last 20 years, anything that was recorded on VCR got counted on the rating? And they only changed that like a year and a half ago, right? I mean, they could have done that 20 years ago, and they haven't. So there's a lot of, lot of things that we can change, whether that will change or not, I don't know. I, I think th there's companies like Rentac now that are putting a little bit more pressure on, on Nielsen to, to uh, embrace th this new world or parts of it. I do, I do think they're going to do it through acquisition. They, don't, they haven't had much success. Uh, doing it in-house, uh, but but I think that there's some competitive pressure to, to, to bring up the standards of measurement. I think actually, Matt, you said something that's really telling about the whole rich media experience. I totally agree with that, and I think, in fact, as Claudio said, I really don't want to be sitting there watching my TV with things popping up all over. I really don't want to be sitting there with my TV with, like, annoying ads. I mean, all the things we could have done with rich media, we did it wrong because we had those annoying pop-up ads, and all the publishers went, do you know what? People don't like it. Close it down, and in future, everything has to be clickable. And it killed the industry from day one. That was it. That was We, we fucked it up in the beginning. We paid the price for it 15 years later. Are we really going to do that in, in terms of television? And, Ken, I want to ask a question to you because I think you're going to be the man to answer this question. I look at television, it's high definition. It's quality, it's quality people, it's quality content. I want it on Blu-ray. I don't, I don't want it to on Blu-ray, realistically. But, I mean, from your perspective, working with those brands and that branding content and everything else, that seems like a far cry from that a little silly, fiddly, annoying, fiddly little ad that I have to click and open. And I mean, how do you see that sort of working in this new world of interactive uh, television? I think the quality of creative needs to be equal across what you're watching, and that's uh, what's going to set things apart. Is you're, if you're watching your Blu-ray quality, eighty-five million dollar blockbuster movie, uh, the insertion ads that are going to be in between that uh, should be uh, at the same level of quality. At, well, not eighty-five million dollar commercials, but um, at least at a at a professional level, where you're not going to see that um, with online video content necessarily. Do you really see that moving over? We see this TV budget moving over to the online. We said. There you go. Here's a million dollars. Go and create some beautiful, you know, high definition quality interactive ad. I mean, what, what, what are we looking at there? Is that what we're actually talking about here, or are we not? Well, I think there's a, a couple of different pieces there. As you're you're watching your regular programming, then uh, the networks are going to want to have quality content um, that they're showing. Uh, but if you were to go dig in deeper, um, let's say it was uh, those shoes that popped up. Um, and you wanted to go in and, and see the uh, 